Welcome to the Politics of Everything. I'm Amber Danes, your host and podcast producer. This is a half hour of power, a podcast dropping every week where I unpack the politics of everything, from money to motherhood, nutrition to narcissism, startups to secularism, the environment, equality, and much, much more. Our guests are seasoned in the field or topic of their choice, even if you've not heard of them yet. This is a non-partisan show. So while I love exploring varied views and get a buzz from a healthy debate of ideas, this is not a purely blue, white, green program. Please subscribe, tune in and enjoy the politics of everything. Lizzie McCauley is the owner of Write It, a copywriting service that helps entrepreneurs and business owners find and use their big voice to build a dedicated following. As a launch copy specialist, she supports business owners to create compelling, character-filled copy that sets their products, services, and businesses up for success. She loves to collaborate with her clients on bold, brave pieces that inspire trust in a brand and build a genuine rapport with their audience. She writes from heart and loves seeing the amazing work that comes out when working with a client who is on the same wavelength. As the world of AI in some ways has made these tasks connected to writing a lot easier for many of us, this podcast is about the finer aspects of the craft and even the mindset that can elevate your copy to be more than a string of words and structured ideas spat out from a chat tool. I wanted to find out much more, so welcome to the politics of everything. Hey there, Amber. Thanks so much for having me. (laughs) Podcasting remotely can be challenging, but it doesn't have to be. Since day one of the politics of everything, I have relied on Zencaster's all-in-one solution to make the process quick and painless, the way it should be for those of us who just love great content and want to get our ideas out into the world. If you know me, I'm obsessed with quality in terms of my guests, my sound, and everything about my show has to be great the first time. I'm time poor. It's so easy to use Zencaster. I'm not tech savvy and you don't need to be either. There's nothing to download. Just click on the link and off we go. Zencaster is all about making your podcasting experience easy and with everything from local recording to automate post-productions now in their toolkit, you don't have to leave your browser to get that episode done and done fast. I have a special offer for you and I hopefully you can experience what I have with Zencaster. Go to Zencaster.com forward slash pricing and use my VIP code, the politics of everything, all lowercase in one word, to get 30% off your first three months of Zencaster Professional. How good is that? I want you to have the same easy experiences I do for all my podcasting and content needs. It's time to share your story. Yeah, it's a big topic. And of course, tech has changed lots of things and we'll get into that in a little bit. But as a kid, did you always want to be in the writing world? Did you know what you wanted to be when you were young, Lizzie? And how did you connect those dots? (laughs) I wish wish it had been such a clear through line, honestly, Amber. It's been an interesting journey. My very first thing that I wanted to do, I wanted to be a chef. And then as I got older, I wanted to be a diplomat or something. I thought it'd be really cool to go work in some embassy in some far-flung country. Obviously, that didn't end up happening. (laughs) So I, yeah, I I did communications and cultural studies at uni. Um, Again, not really knowing where that would end up. And when you say communications, you mean written communications as opposed to to visual or something like that? Is that or just the the study of how we communicate? It was it was an arts degree, so it was. uh, It was a little loosey goosey on how that ended Broad, up. Broad, as they say. <laughs> Broad education. <laughs> exactly. But it, it, it really did shape the way that I see things. And, and obviously, it was kind of a weird predictor to where I ended up, which I didn't even know that that being a professional writer was a thing that that I would be good at. I like I liked writing. And I did I think look, it's it's kind of a flake thing. It's a bit of a shame, but I have had upwards of maybe 35 plus jobs in my life. Um, not necessarily in, in 35 industries, but just different interests because I never really settled on any one thing. And it was kind of this thing of just because you can do something doesn't mean you should. <laughs> so I ended up, you know, bouncing around lots of hospitality work and then uh, sort of administrative stuff. And it just never really lit me up. And I've, I worked, uh, the last job I had before this was as a travel agent and then just out of interest I decided while I was doing my travel agenting that I would also 
uh, pursue a, a postgrad degree in um, editing and publishing and happened that one of my travel agency clients worked at the local paper in the classifieds area and I just sort of bumped her up for a for an internship I said don't suppose there's anything I could like come into the office and see how it works and and then I got a job as the features writer and for the local paper and the rest is kind of history from there it's just grown and grown that's nearly oh gosh that's nearly 10 years ago now so it's good to know that the how you got to where you were and obviously you found what's actually lighting you up these days but how is the way we approach and deliver copywriting changed over time and there's some examples of maybe what you saw a decade or so ago versus what now is required or is it kind of something that's similar but it's just evolved in a different way well, that's a, that's a really interesting thing. Obviously, AI has had a big impact on the quality of, of what's being produced at the moment. I know we're going to talk a bit more about that going forward, but I think one of the biggest changes is is mostly around style. Things are much more conversational, human-centered these days. Lots of empathy involved in creating really compelling copy that people actually want to read. Like we don't want to be spoken to like like the person writing is a robot, even though, you know, the the overarching thing that people seem to strive for when they're not quite in the in the industry that I'm in is oh but we need to be professional but friendly like that is the tone and (laughs) it doesn't really cut it anymore I teach uh, oh yeah that's so so that's one side of things and the other thing that I really teach is you know one of the most common things people get told is to focus on the pain points but I would argue Amber that in fact the pain points we are already quite aware of (laughs) <laughs> the, the struggles we're having and that really the most effective thing you can do is to paint a really bright paint the picture of the bright future that's coming when you overcome those pain points so it's having awareness of the pain points but then actually <laughs> speaking to the future instead because that's much more hopeful I think and positive <laughs> Absolutely. No, I love that. And of course, yes, generative AI has become a big thing and everyone uses things like chat GPT to maybe do some frameworks or get ideas for topics, for example, for writing-based tasks. I must admit when it first came along, I was reluctant to use it even with what I do, which is much more sort of PR and communications based on sort of, I guess, corporate writing. Do you utilize it in what you do? And of obviously it can't be a full replacement, otherwise you wouldn't have a business. But like, how do you really approach and integrate it or make sure that it's not something that's being overly relied on so that we lose that, I guess, that creativity and that empathy, which of course no chatbot yet has. No. <laughs> and look, I, I think it's a really, it's a tricky one because really there is no replacement for human ingenuity and, and lateral thinking, of course. But there is a place for it as well. It certainly is really very, very handy for things like idea generation and and just pulling these basic strategies and uh, and ideas together so that you've got a really strong foundation on which to build from. I think people are missing a trick if they leave it at whatever is suggested through whatever tool they're using when they have so much of their own brilliance and creativity to infuse through it and their own character Um, but there's there's definitely a space for it I I personally I don't use it for um, client work (laughs) because I think it's quite obvious when you know when you can sort of compare something that I write versus something that the uh, the chat gods have produced. I think it's obvious too, but I'm amazed the amount of people that think it's not that bad. And maybe that's mm-hmm. because if you're not, I'm not, I don't necessarily everyone's a natural born writer, but if it's not something yeah. you 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 enjoy or you're prolific with, you know, it, I mean, I must admit, I have just from some of my more junior stuff, we've used it as a framework just to kind yeah. of go, okay, yeah. you need to write this particular strategy. What would be the bits in it? But then mm-hmm. we'll curate that and obviously put our own ideas and expertise in it. And if it hasn't had that lens to it, I think the writing is pretty ordinary. Uh, yeah yeah I think or, or it just seems like it, it sometimes is so off the mark so it'll give lots of examples that are like irrelevant to our industry or they'll kind of statistics that you know kind of feel very Americanized like mm. I, I can see it but then I guess I'm looking for it too well there's a couple of things there there's one is that the likes of you and I maybe hold ourselves to a different standard when it comes to what we create like that is the thing that we are prioritizing where other business owners perhaps like that's not their their thing they don't really care as long as something is said 
you know, like the, the, there's just different priorities there. But also, yeah, it is glaringly obvious when <laughs> there's, there's a piece that's like in a world where blah, 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 blah. Like it, there's a lot of hyperbole that comes out of the AI. I think on the inverse of that, there are a lot of people who are listening who would be like, well, you clearly just haven't give, given good enough prompts yet. Yes, uh, I've heard that. You ha- you're just using it too generically or you haven't p- used the paid version, which I refuse to do. But <laughs> well, I look, it's, uh, I, yeah, me, me too. I think it, for me, I, I, I refuse because I'm a crutchy old lady who wants to do things my way, damn it. But <laughs> um, it's hard. I know. Well, I, yeah, I've always find the hardest way to do anything, unfortunately. <laughs> but I think, look, I, I get why people would want to use it, especially if it's not your area of expertise. It's not the thing you want to spend your time on. And you frankly don't necessarily have the budget for, for someone like you or I. Like it's, it's really tempting. I can completely understand how it gets there in the first place. But ultimately, I would argue that the, the businesses that will thrive are the businesses that prioritise quality over anything else yeah and I think subject matter expertise too particularly if it's more technical writing um Mm. it's hard to replicate that with information that you would get from a very broad data set which is really what chat gpt and other tools are actually doing as well look you talk about embracing one's voice whether you're a natural speaker or an introvert how do you actually help people do this because I imagine copywriting is not entirely a personal exercise for some people, like they don't necessarily relate to having empathy in their business writing, for example. How do you actually coach this and make this happen? Well, this is this is I've built my entire business around this exact skill because <laughs> I, I would secret argue, source question really. <laughs> you're asking for my formula. No, <laughs> I think uh, realistically, if if you're not writing from a human perspective then you're completely missing the point you know businesses aren't selling to other businesses or like it's people who are selling to people right it's not the entity that's selling it's somebody has written the thing for somebody who's going to receive the thing and so I I honestly believe that the fundamental point of any kind of writing for business or otherwise is to understand the human component of that so uh, realistically Everybody has a story. Like my, my podcast is all about diving into the, the background of, of, you know, how someone's business came to be and that starts with their story. Everybody has a story and a perspective and a signature way of framing the things that they say and that's what becomes memorable that's what becomes recognizable is your signature voice and that's what matters because you build your community around that and you build like-minded people uh, like a, a runway, I suppose, for like-minded people to come towards you. That way the business you build becomes far more enjoyable because you're surrounded by people who get you and you're not worried about, oh, what if everybody likes me? What if nobody likes me? You just say what you need <laughs> to say and then build your business around that rather than hoping for the best that you're pleasing everybody. Mm. And everybody. it's about knowing your audience, obviously. I mean, it's very basic stuff, but, yeah. you know, to make it land, it can't be too g- generic really well no well because if you're speaking to everybody you're speaking to nobody in the end so you know like if if someone can't see themselves in the picture you're painting then that's a real problem so being very very clear and sometimes people struggle to to decide what their niche is and sometimes simply the niche is you you know as the business owner and your style and your tone and it doesn't really matter as much what other people think of what you're doing so long as you enjoy it and then you know you can exude this confidence around really embodying the work that you produce and when you're working with someone new for the first time and it happens in my business too you don't necessarily have that natural rapport yet you don't really know them you might just be communicating either by email or done a quick zoom with them Mm. how do you actually tap into that sort of voice with them because you might be pushing them into a new area or out of their comfort Mm. zone I imagine and that can be challenging too very true I just asked lots of pointy questions (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> what's your favorite color no I'm joking <laughs> I know what you mean though it's no tell me about like what do you like what do you not like look what's, mm. what's happening now and do you know what it's an iterative process it doesn't ever stay the same forever and if somebody is is sort of expecting oh right we've done our messaging that's it that's probably like set and forget stuff yeah, yeah. 
Well, it's not because, I mean, how much, let's let's say, let's look back over the last 10 years, how much has happened to either of us, how mm. much of how our perspectives and our worldviews changed, how much has what's happened in our own lives shaped what we do next and how we want to do things, what we want to say. I guarantee you uh, the, what we said in our 20s would be very different to what we say in our 30s and 40s. And so to to sort of tap into what is it that I actually want to say and and make sure that that's something that you do regularly. I think it's a really important part of being a a leader in your, in your business. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I guess over time, as you get to know them, you know, like you say, they might evolve. And I I even think about that. I I sometimes have this kind of internal battle between, oh, but I said this this way five years ago, and now that's not necessarily true. But I I imagine a lot of people aren't necessarily connecting the dots in the way that I would be and kind of, you know, berating themselves about, you know, their point of view or their kind of style of writing. Historically, their people are very focused on the here and now as well. Well, especially your audience, like maybe, maybe you might be measuring it for your own, but I guarantee you someone uh, in your, in your audience isn't going, do you know what? She said something different five years ago. Like (laughs) nobody's looking that far backwards and, and nobody's looking that far outwards either. And that's kind of really one of the main principles of, of, of pulling compelling copy together is that we're not writing about ourselves. We're writing about our audience. So <laughs> they're not going to be looking at what we're doing. They're looking at what they're doing, I guess is yeah. how you could put it. Yeah, no, and I think that we all think everyone's looking at us. But I, when I do public speaking training, I said the same thing. You think everyone's looking at you, but people are fairly preoccupied in their own heads, even when they're yeah. being engaged by an amazing speaker, you know, yeah. or they're focused on other things happening in a room. So yeah. that often takes the pressure away as well, I think, and allows you probably to tap more into that more authentic style of communicating um, mm. because you're not so conscious of what everyone else might be perceiving you as because you're never going to really know that unless no. you know, they tell you. <laughs> no, exactly. And even if they do tell you, hey, that's great feedback, isn't it? <laughs> exactly. Feedback's super important. How do you deal with feedback as well? I mean, I, mm. I guess that's a big part of what you do. I don't know. I That's a really great question. I don't think I get much feedback. Like, uh, I mean, people would tell you if they hate it, I'm sure. But if they love it, they tell you. And then there's the in-between where it's just they're happy, right? Yeah, well, there's silence. If people, (laughs) it's just like, okay, that's cool. So I think the the, the older I get and the more I do this, like I'm four and a half years into this specific business and nearly a decade into being a professional writer. And realistically, I'm only just now starting to get into, do you know what? I'm tired of being like, the gentle pleasant person and I'm really stepping into do you know what (laughs) it's time to say some things so I think perhaps some cages will be rattled (laughs) more so in the future but it's it's really important that people feel that they have the right and the ability and the confidence to say what they actually want to say so I have really stepped in in this last little while into the role of encouraging people to do that because why shouldn't they have the opportunity to say what they want to say in the way they want to say it uh everyone's got an important message to share it's just about figuring out how to how to articulate it I guess yeah absolutely and I think that's kind of what people rely on you to do as well you know that's why they're tapping into your expertise and, and hiring you what's the best way in your view to approach copywriting versus other types of prose like a blog or a script and all the bits and pieces I guess that come into a broader communication suite what makes copywriting that little bit different well you know I'd argue that the the foundational principles are kind of the same like of course of course they're strategic kind of differences strategic nuances but both sales copy and and the more regular content as you say like blogs social posts and so on um, they're in the business of building trust and rapport with your audience Uh, it's it's just that with the copy side of things there's at least somebody asking for the sale at the end of it (laughs) so you know I I think as long as you're keeping the audience in mind, like so we're, we're, we're actually writing to the reader, not about yourself. Like the amount of times I see things like, for example, uh, I'm really experienced. I have 20 years experience. Okay, that's cool. <laughs> that doesn't mean anything. It's very to bland. 
Like, okay, great. So what? So that actually, it's 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 my biggest, biggest, biggest tool that I give to everybody. It's it sounds kind of rude unless I give the full explanation, uh, and even then, I still feel icky saying it sometimes. But we really need to interrogate the so what of everything that we write. So I have experience. Yeah, cool. So what? That means that I know exactly who to talk to in the industry. That means that you know <laughs> the job will be done faster, better, you know, there's more trust, whatever it is that you need to say about that that experience, what that experience gives the reader, the easier the argument is that you're the best person for the job. So so that kind of tool is something that that I rely on even in my own work. But you know, I I, I teach this out a lot. And one of the main things that we do is like, okay, this is cool. So where are we taking it from here? You know, because there really needs to be that emotional buy-in from whoever's reading it to go, this matters to me. And you can't do that if you're keeping it about yourself. I'd yeah. Say. Yeah. No, that that's really clear. And I think for a lot of people listening, they would be nodding and agreeing with, with that view as well. Changing tack a little bit. What is your number one business tool at the moment or hack? And it can't be your smartphone. That's and fun. why do you just love it? What's, what's it kind of helping you do? And it could be in that copywriting space, or it could even be something you do in your personal life. Do you know what? I really actually had to take some time to think about that question because, <laughs> as I said, I, I kind of find the hardest possible way to do everything always. Um, but I think really what is most important, especially for, for business owners who are working from home or have a fairly small team, is is to just really find your tribe, I guess, is the way of putting it. Find people who understand what it is that you're trying to achieve and want to support you in that I think there's lots of people who are trying to be supportive that we have in our own worlds particularly people perhaps who have more of an employee mindset uh, who are quite happy to uh, stay risk-free and they're quite risk-averse people and they don't understand what it's like to be in business and trying to build something and trying to achieve all these great big things kind of by yourself with all the responsibility being on your own shoulders so finding people who get it and who understand when you have to work late or that you have to prioritize your business sometimes over your personal life your health your family whatever and, and just finding people who understand and want to push you forward and make you better the same way that you make them better. I think that's probably the hack that has been most helpful to me over the last decade. And is that sort of led into my next question is about your biggest life lesson to date and why, or is it something different? It's actually something different. This is something I, I, I love this so much because it's actually my big brother told me this when I was learning to drive, <laughs> but it applies across the board. My, my big brother, Dan, told me life is 10% skill and 90% attitude. And you know what? That has stayed with me for a really, really long time. Uh, (laughs) Like you don't have to know everything about what you're doing, but your willingness to pursue it really is the most important thing because you'll learn the skills as you go, but you you need to have the attitude to, to start in the first place. Yeah, I agree. And I think that is in all areas of excellence, you know, whether you're an athlete or you're a business owner or whatever, that's, you know, a lot of people will say that I wasn't the smartest at school or I didn't have all the answers, but I learned and I was hungry and I pushed myself and and that's how we got there. That natural ability, I think, sometimes can be deceptive and it doesn't always lead to success, which leads me to my next question is how do you define your version of success these days? <laughs> this, was, this was a terrible question to answer because that was hard. <laughs> it is hard, but I love to get to know in the short amount of time I have with my guests, I guess what makes them tick and also what mm. sort of recalibrates them. Yeah. Well, th- this is a tricky one because, you know, the defaults, of course, is to say, oh, finding balance between my family and my business and my health. And da, da, da. and that's definitely, that's a big part of it, having financial freedom. All these things are definitely not, not on the list, but I really reflected on this because I wanted to give uh, the question, the the amount of sort of reflection it deserved. And I think really what's been the most gratifying thing, the most, the biggest signal of success, I would say, is seeing not only what my, my teaching is, had the impact it's having on my 
people but on their people too so for instance I've got I've got a client based in Boston in the US who who came to me and was just just not getting traction with where she was uh, and because she she just hadn't nailed down her messaging yet and she was trying to be all things to all people and it wasn't landing at all Mm. And so I really, it took me about three months to nudge her fully into this is what you know. Okay, three months is extreme. It was a month and a half of saying, you got to do it. Let's try this. Let's try this. Just try it. If it doesn't work, let it go. We'll do something else. But please, please, let's try it. And as soon as she picked her lane, she has absolutely gone bananas in her industry. She is like highly sought after like <laughs> being asked to speak at events, being asked to do tele things. She's teaching and you know, she's booked out all of these things, which is really, really great. And that's like success number one. But now, now that she's chosen that and she's teaching out what she knows in the way that she knows. So she's gone from being a generalist service based coach to uh, she owns a very successful cleaning business. And so now she's teaching cleaners how to also run successful cleaning businesses. And that has led to not only her having a really great year financially but also now her clients are starting to transform their lives and the lives of their families so to sort of watch that ripple effect starting to take place look that's kind of pretty gratifying that's a pretty sure sign of success for me I'd say nice I love that and just a final message for us today as we wrap up our conversation on the politics of copywriting a tricky one so <laughs> I think I think my final message is this is is simply that no matter what you're already enough as you are right there, there's lots and lots and lots of loud voices that are going to tell us that we have to do it this way or that we have to do it that way or we're not enough or we're, we need to do more and some of those loud voices are in our own heads by the way and not external to us but just trust yourself that you already know what's best for you and your business or, or you and your family or you and your whatever, right? If it doesn't feel right, find a way that does. I yeah. think that's that's my lesson. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it's been fabulous to chat to you today and pick your copywriting brain. Of course, if you do want to connect further with Lizzie, there are details on the show notes. Until next time, take care. Thanks so much for listening today. If you've enjoyed the politics of everything, I thrive on your feedback. So please add a short review and share the podcast with your network through Apple, Spotify, and all the usual suspects. I'm always on the hunt for new and diverse guests, so if you or someone you know has a fresh idea you're busting to get out there, please email me at amber at amberdanes.com and my crew will get back to you very soon.